In our modern usage today, the word beast often implies something dangerous or evil. But when the Bible uses the word beast, whether in the Old or New Testament, the word means simply an animal with nothing sinister implied. And that's sometimes the meaning even in modern usage, as when we say, the weather outside isn't fit for man or beast, or we may call a donkey a beast of burden. But the Bible's beast of revelation truly is a monster and is enough to frighten anyone. The Apostle John describes this way what he saw in a vision. <clears throat> and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but he had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. What a terrifying sight. So who or what is this beast of revelation? And when is this prophetic vision fulfilled? Should we expect such a monster to crawl out of the sea in the near future? What does the Bible really say about the beast of revelation? Welcome to Bible Nook's worship service. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious privilege you give your people of coming together to worship you, to fellowship together, whether in person or remotely, to hear your word, to lift up our voices in songs of praise to you, and to be reminded of the wonderful things in your word. As we need to be called aside, Lord, from the busyness and distractions and lies of this world around us, and reminded what the real purpose of life is, what life is all about, and what our role is, in this life. So we pray that you'll bless our time together now as we look into your word and sing your praises. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Let's join together in singing, When Peace Like a River is Well with My Soul.
When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, he gave them the words of the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. And that prayer serves as a model for our own prayers, teaching us what our priorities should be when we approach the Lord. But the Lord's Prayer has also served to unite Christians all over the earth as we worship together and repeat those words together. Let's join together now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. These live streamed services are aimed at providing traditional worship services for believers who otherwise would not have them because they're confined to the home or because they don't have a nearby church that sings traditional hymns and preaches Bible messages. And these services are also aimed at reaching the world with messages proclaiming and upholding the gospel of Christ. After the live service on Sunday mornings, our messages remain online and continue to reach thousands of people across the country. <clears throat> During the year 2022, the thumbnail images of our messages, some of which you see here, some recent ones, our thumbnails during 2022 were displayed to well over 3 million people. And as a result, almost 21,000 people viewed our message showing godless evolution to be false. And more than 80,000 viewed our message on the signs leading up to Christ's return. Our other messages are reaching additional thousands each week. To accomplish that, Bible Nook spent $5,111 during the year most of it going to Facebook and Google YouTube to boost our messages. Bible Nook received during that same time period $4,259 as gifts from four couples and one individual, with my wife and I covering the $852 additional expense from our own personal funds. I took no salary from Bible Nook and neither did anyone else. As we've entered the year 2023, some others have joined in supporting this work. If that continues, we hope to reach an even wider audience with these messages. If the Lord moves your heart to spend some of your resources on this gospel outreach, you can do so by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the donate button on the home page. Today's scripture reading is from the books of Revelation and Daniel, beginning with Revelation 13, verse 1. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. And now Daniel chapter 7, beginning with verse 3. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, 
terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The four beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of his word. Let's join together now in singing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, Christ the Solid Rock. In our modern usage today, the word beast often implies something dangerous or evil. But when the Bible uses the word beast, whether in the Old or New Testament, the word means simply an animal, with nothing sinister implied. And that's sometimes the meaning even in modern usage, as when we say, the weather outside isn't fit for man nor beast. Or we may call a donkey a beast of burden. But the Bible's beast of revelation truly is a monster, and it's enough to frighten anyone. The Apostle John describes this way what he saw in a vision. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns in his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. What a terrifying sight. Who or what is this beast of revelation? And when is this prophetic vision fulfilled? 
Should we expect such a monster to crawl out of the sea in the near future? What does the Bible really say about the beast of Revelation? Well, if you're a devoted fan of the Left Behind novels and movies, then you already know the answer. The beast of Revelation is Nikolai Carpathia. According to Left Behind, he's the Antichrist of John's letters. He's the beast of Revelation 13.1. He's the man of sin from 2 Thessalonians 2.3. And he's the fierce ruler of Daniel 8.23. That fiction series conveniently rolls together into that one character, Nikolai Carpathia, just about every evil villain there is. And here we see a picture of the cover of one of the volumes of the Left Behind series, titled Nikolai. But is that what the Bible writers intended? Is that how the divine author of the Bible meant for us to interpret it? What about the great Bible scholars whose understanding of Scripture formed the basis of Protestant belief over the past 500 years or more? Martin Luther's study of the Bible laid the foundation for all the Protestant churches since the Reformation. Yet Martin Luther did not take Left Behind's view of the Beast of Revelation. <coughs> John Calvin is still looked to as the greatest Bible scholar by the Reformed churches. But Calvin did not take Left Behind's view of the Beast of Revelation. John Wesley is seen as the founder of the Methodist and Holiness church traditions. Wesley did not see in the Bible the Left Behind view of the Beast of Revelation. Roger Williams started the first Baptist church in America and he did not believe the Left Behind way either. Charles Haddon Spurgeon is looked up to by many as the Prince of Preachers, but he did not believe in the Left Behind story either. You can add to that list such illustrious Bible scholars as Wycliffe, Tyndale, Jonathan Edwards, and so on. None of them believed in the Left Behind view the beast of Revelation 13, 1. The left behind view of Revelation's beast is not what Protestants in general believed for hundreds of years from before the Reformation until the early 20th century. Why not? Because they allowed the Bible to interpret itself. They looked to scripture to explain scripture. When they saw John in Revelation writing about a beast coming out of the sea, they looked up other Bible passages talking about the same thing. to See if those other passages explain this passage. So let's do that. Let's see if there are any other Bible passages written prior to the Revelation that talk about a beast coming out of the sea. What do we find? Well, we find an Old Testament passage about beasts coming out of the sea and it explains what they meant. The explanation is provided in detail in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. We find that just as in John, in Revelation, where he saw a vision of a beast coming out of the sea, the Old Testament prophet Daniel also had a vision where four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Daniel saw a beast coming out of the sea in his vision, just as John did. That shouldn't surprise us, since the same Almighty God who showed John his vision also showed Daniel his vision. And the similarity does not end there. The similarity does not end with the fact that Daniel saw a beast coming up out of the sea and John saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Look how similar the descriptions of these beasts are. John says, And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns. The beast that I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And Daniel describes what he saw. Four great beasts came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion. The second beast, which looked like a bear. 
another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful, and it had ten horns. Notice the similarities. The mouth of Daniel's first beast, the lion. The body of Daniel's third beast, the leopard. The feet of Daniel's second beast, the bear. And the ten horns of Daniel's fourth beast all come together as parts of the Revelation beast. The Revelation 13 beast has the mouth, the feet, the body, and the horns of Daniel's beasts. So the beast John saw in Revelation was like the beast Daniel saw all rolled into one. That cannot be a coincidence. In fact, of all the animals or beasts that could have appeared in Daniel's vision and that could have appeared in John's vision, there could have been antelopes, baboons, badgers, bison, buffaloes, bulldogs, camels, cows, crocodiles, deer, donkeys, elephants, and so on. Anything from alligators to zebras. But instead, John's vision coincided exactly with Daniel's, naming a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a ten-horned beast. It's obvious that the similarity was intentional, not a coincidence. God intended for John to see in vision a beast that combined Daniel's beast into one. So if we can determine the meaning of Daniel's vision, it will help us understand Revelation's very similar vision. What did Daniel's vision mean? Well, the answer is easy because God had an angel explain to Daniel what was meant by the beast coming up out of the sea? The angel told Daniel, the four beasts are four kingdoms that will rise. The answer is so clear and unmistakable that Bible scholars down through the centuries have been practically unanimous in agreeing that the four beasts Daniel saw represented the series of kingdoms or empires the series of great world powers that ruled over the promised land down through history from Daniel's time onward. They were the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. So if the beast of Revelation is Daniel's four beasts all rolled into one, then the beast of Revelation is the conglomeration of human governments that ruled over the promised land down through history. And that's exactly the conclusion reached by respected Bible commentator Matthew Henry. He was a Christian minister who wrote about every verse in the Bible in an extensive commentary that he wrote in the 1600s and 1700s. In his concise commentary on the Bible, Matthew Henry saw the seven-headed beast as encompassing all the Gentile world powers from the Babylonian Empire through the Roman Empire. Notice, too, that the angel explained to Daniel that the horns of the fourth beast represented governments, governments that would arise after the Roman Empire as well. Daniel says, of the fourth beast, I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up. And then Daniel tells how the angel answered his questions. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise. So the ten horns are the ten kingdoms that came from the collapse of the Roman Empire the territories that were formerly controlled by Rome, when the empire collapsed, they became 10 independent nations all across Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa, where the Roman Empire used to rule. And then after those nations ruled for a while, another kingdom would arise according to the prophecy. The seventh and eighth chapters of Daniel describe this other kingdom as a little horn that started out little and became quite big. It's an empire whose territory would include the promised land. Martin Luther identified that little horn kingdom that started small but grew to great power 
as the Islamic empire that conquered North Africa and the Middle East. The Islamic empire kept control of the promised land until modern times when the allies defeated the Ottoman Turks in the First World War. So the composite beast of revelation has already been around for a long, long time, if this understanding of scripture is correct, and that beast remains with us today. So which is correct? The view of the beast as the world's governments down through history, including today, or the left behind view that the beast is that Nikolai Carpathia character in the novel? It matters because if the left behind view is correct, Christians have nothing to be concerned about. Nikolai won't become the beast until after the rapture, according to Left Behind. So we'll be raptured and gone from the earth and won't have to face him. You can see why that view is popular and appealing. Its message is, don't worry, you won't have to face any of the distressing images in Revelation. That's an appealing thought that makes it easy to accept the Left Behind view. The left behind view is also simpler and easier to understand than the variety of historical interpretations presented by Luther, Calvin, Spurgeon, and respected commentators like Matthew Henry. But if their traditional understanding is correct and left behind is wrong, then the beast of revelation is an evil force that we believers do have to deal with. The beast is not a future villain in the movies, but rather a real enemy that we need to be aware of right now. For example, if Martin Luther is correct in identifying the beast's little horn as Islamic powers, then we need to pay closer attention to the prophecies. Martin Luther said, This same little horn will fight the saints and blaspheme Christ, something that we are all experiencing and seeing before our very eyes. The Turk has had great victories against the Christians, yet denies Christ while elevating his Muhammad. Luther identified the Islamic power as the little horn in Daniel chapters 7 and 8 that opposes God's holy people. John Calvin, Sir Isaac Newton, and Jonathan Edwards also joined with Luther in attaching great prophetic significance to the Islamic power. If they are correct, then this understanding can guide us in seeing the biblical significance of modern events in the Middle East. But where did the left behind view come from? This newer interpretation that throws aside the traditional understanding. The names Edward Irving, Margaret MacDonald, and John Nelson Darby keep coming up in answer to that question. Because the reformers kept pointing to the Vatican and the papacy as their chief candidate for the Antichrist, Roman Catholic Jesuits wrote books proposing a future Antichrist instead to take the heat off the Pope. A pastor named Edward Irving translated one of those Jesuit books into English and published it in London in 1827. Then in 1830, a 15-year-old girl named Margaret MacDonald claimed to have a vision. Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel explained his belief in the Left Behind teaching this way. Chuck Smith said, the story goes that in a meeting in England, a woman began to exhort the church through the gift of prophecy, and she said that the Lord was going to take his church out and save it from the wrath to come. <clears throat> We're told that men like Darby and Schofield then began to popularize this view. Why would the Lord reveal it to Luther, Calvin, or any of the Reformation church leaders? They weren't living in the age when the church was to be taken out. And that quote is from Chuck Smith's article, The Tribulation and the Church. The Darby he referred to was John Nelson Darby, who spread this view by preaching it to Plymouth Brethren churches. Although they lived in the same area at the same time, the interactions between Edward Irving, Margaret MacDonald, and 
John Nelson Darby, a subject of controversy and debate. In any case, notes in the Schofield Reference Bible popularized the Left Behind story in the early 1900s. And then more recently, the New York Times best-selling novel, Left Behind, led to sequels, movies, games, more than 100 million products that were sold, grossing over a billion dollars in the Left Behind series, with untold millions of people persuaded by seeing that Left Behind version of events in living color. But does that make it true? Or is there more reason to believe that the Beast of Revelation has been with us for centuries, as taught by Luther, Calvin, Spurgeon, and long-standing Protestant belief? You can dig into the details if you wish. I've assembled a lot of that information in a series of books that you can read online for free. They're available in print from Amazon, but you can also read them online for free and download them in digital form from my BibleNook.com website. These books compare the Left Behind teachings verse by verse with the understanding of revelation that Protestants held for centuries before the new Left Behind teaching became popular. But the most important thing to know from Daniel's vision of the beasts and the related vision in Revelation is what happens to the beastly governments and who conquers them and rules in their place. The angel told Daniel earlier, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. The kingdom set up by God is the kingdom Jesus taught us to pray for in the Lord's Prayer, when he gave us the words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Daniel saw that kingdom prophetically in this same vision that we've been looking at. He continues right after finishing his description of the beasts. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. And then in verse 13, he says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Notice that Daniel saw a son of man going into God's heavenly presence. Our Lord Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, meaning that he was the one who would fulfill this prophecy. Jesus said, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Jesus will return as King of the Kingdom of God. When he was on trial before the High Court of the Jews, the high priest demanded that Jesus tell them if he was the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, After this you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of the sky. Jesus knew that the Jewish religious leaders would understand this to be a reference to the book of Daniel. And Daniel 7.14 continues, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Daniel's prophecy about the beasts culminated in Messiah's eternal kingdom. The whole succession of ungodly human governments including the governments of today's world, will be destroyed and replaced by the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ as king. But they won't go peacefully. Revelation chapter 19 tells us how Christ will conquer the nations when he returns in power as king of God's kingdom. 
John says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice, he judges and makes war. We know that's Jesus because verse 16 says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 19 continues, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. Yes, it's a frightening vision, but it's also a comforting vision. God's people have been oppressed for centuries by the beastly rule of human government. But as the prophecies make clear, God will bring that evil beast to an end. Christ's kingdom will bring an end to human misery and will bring in peace and joy forever. And there's every reason to expect that this will happen soon. As we've discussed in detail in other messages, world events in fulfillment of Bible prophecy give us reason to believe that we're living in the end times, the last days of this world. There is plenty of reason and plenty of evidence that the kingdom Christians have been praying for over the centuries is about to come and to put an end to the beast of Revelation. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy of knowing that you are the one author of the entire Bible, the one who told all the writers what to write, from Daniel to John hundreds of years later, completing the prophecy about the beasts coming out of the sea. We thank you, Lord, that you've shown us these things in your word to strengthen us and to guide us and to equip us to face the challenges of this world today and to give us hope, that wonderful hope, that these wicked governments that act like wild beasts will soon be replaced by your kingdom. And we pray for that kingdom to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in singing Onward Christian Soldiers. Oh. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for the things in your word that refresh us and strengthen us and comfort us and guide us. Help us, please, to keep your word in our hearts as we go about our business this week with the gospel message on our lips to share with all who will hear. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you with his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we meet again. Our 7 o'clock Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer meeting is studying the Bible now using the book, Come Follow Jesus, the Real Jesus. It's a book filled with Bible scripture verses in bold print to stand out from the text, and it presents the Bible's message in simple terms for non-believers and new believers to grasp and for all of us to review what we believe. We'll be continuing this week in the chapter titled, What Jesus Revealed About Life After Death. You can find the book in printed form, and there's a link to do so at BibleNook.com. Uh, you can find it on Amazon, and that link will take you right to the book on Amazon. But there's no need to buy anything, because at BibleNook.com, you'll also find the book in digital form, where you can read it for free online, print it out, download it in digital form for free, and use it for the Bible study. So anytime after 6.45 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, just dial this number, 951-799-9542, and you'll be connected to our conference line, or click the permanent Zoom link that's posted on Facebook. We're all joining the study together remotely, and we can pray together over the electronic means that the Lord has provided. If you join us early or stay on afterwards, we can also chat informally. And immediately after the service this morning, we'll have opportunity to fellowship informally. I'll be there if you call that conference line number or click the Zoom link that I'll be firing up in a moment. So please join us for a few minutes if you can. God bless. Keep safe.